Good morning and welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 5th of June and this quick look at the week ahead beginning Monday the 8th of June. So some of the data that I will be talking about will actually be happening over the weekend. Um, before we get started just a couple of disclaimers um, as we start to look back at the price action of the last week or so um, which has been yet another positive week for global equity markets and um, European markets in general. We've broken out through a number of key levels on the upside and in the case of the NASDAQ 100 we've actually seen uh, new record highs. So equity markets continue to really only know one direction at this point in time and that's to go ever higher. Um, and you know, when when you look at when you look at the divergence um, between what the economic data is telling us and what the markets are telling us, it's it's chalk and cheese. I mean, if I'm honest, I hate this rally because the rally runs completely counterintuitively to what the economic data is telling us. The data is terrible, and while you can make the argument that the worst is probably behind us in terms of the data. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to get a V-shaped recovery, and that's certainly what markets are pricing in. You're certainly seeing that on the FTSE 100. We've continued to push high. We've finally broken above that 50% Fibonacci retracement level from the 6,230 level. We sort of flirted with it towards the end of last week, um, finally broke through it on the Wednesday. We are currently in the process of potentially trading all the way back up to 6,580. And if we look at the weekly chart, we can see straight away, again, three positive weeks. The move off the lows that we saw all the way back in March has been nothing short of staggering. Um, back towards levels that we last saw all the way back at the beginning of March before lockdown. At the moment, the FTSE is trying to fill this gap here uh, between 6,200 and the lows on this candle of 6,400. Um, we are around about there now. But certainly, if you look at the FTSE and you look at, say, for example, the German DAX and a similar chart here, we've broken above the 200 day moving average. We can actually draw a line through these lows. And you can conceivably argue that there's, there is certainly a lot more potential now that we've broken through a number of these key levels for further further gains essentially back to the highs that we saw um, in February which is an absolutely mind-boggling turnaround and it's not because the economy is going to be in a much better place than markets were thinking at the beginning of the year it's simply because of the amount of money that's been thrown at the problem not only by central banks, and central banks are throwing a mind-boggling amount of money at it only, the, uh, only this week. The European Central Bank um, upped its pandemic emergency purchase program by another 600 billion euros to 1.35 trillion euros. Now, there's some who will argue that it wasn't necessary for them to do that, given that they actually haven't even used the, seven, the initial 750 billion euros. But we've also had the German government this week undergoing a significant fiscal stimulus program, another fiscal stimulus program, this time 130 billion euros, um, largely made up of um, loans to small businesses and targeted VAT and other tax cuts. So when you tie that in with the fiscal stimulus that's coming out of the US, there's talk now of another fiscal stimulus program in light of the unrest that you're seeing ripple out across US cities and the huge fiscal stimulus program undertaken by UK authorities, there is an absolute wall of money, a wall of money flowing into stock markets at the moment or flowing into the global economy. And some of that is going into stock markets. One thing I would say, despite the gains that we've seen this week over the course of the past three weeks, in equity markets, gold is only a little bit weaker. So while there is this 
expectation that central banks will remain in pretty much full-fledged easing mode for the foreseeable future. And when I say the foreseeable future, I mean the next four to five years at the very least. Um, the prospect of gold falling sharply is probably fairly low, given the risks that this could actually turn out to be inflationary two or three years down the line. At the moment, there's no risk of inflation, very much concerns about deflation, hence why the European Central Bank justified this extra 600 billion euros. But there are still political considerations to um, think about in terms of the fiscal stimulus that the European Commission have also said that they are looking to implement next year. There is a significant chance that the fiscal stimulus which is being driven by the European Union, European Commission, could actually get watered down, and in fact could not happen at all. So there is an element of hope over expectation when it comes to some of these measures. But nonetheless, it's been enough to help drive equity markets back above some very key um, resistance levels. And in this case, it's the DAX above the 200-day moving average. The 50-day moving average is starting to turn higher. Momentum is clearly positive. And we very much remain in buy the dip mode. Um, I talked an awful lot about over the course of the past couple of weeks that while we were below these significant resistance levels, I remain suspicious of this rally um, simply because of the fact that there was significant resistance in and around um, some very key um, previous highs. Now these highs have given way, you really do have to go um, with the momentum. And the momentum is you're getting higher lows, you're getting higher highs. So essentially, we are now in a very much by the dip mode. So the prospect of a retest of these peaks that we saw at the beginning of the year certainly remains very much on the cards while we're above. For me, I think the, the, the support level, apart from this line, this blue line here, is 11,568, which is essentially the 61.8 Fibonacci retracement level um, of this entire down move. It's a similar story for the S&P 500. You can see that here. It's also broken above its 200-day moving average. And as those of you who follow me will know, when these indices, and, and I look at the Nikkei, I look at the DAX, and I look at the S&P, when they all confirm a break of a similar technical indicator, that generally tends to play into my policy of looking at Dow theory, the histories, the, the, the indicators basically need to, the averages confirm each other. So in this case, I look at the S&P, I look at the DAX, they move in a fairly similar way. The fact that both of these indicators have broken, both of these indexes have broken above the 200 day suggests there's more to come. Given the fact that the NASDAQ has retested its previous all time highs, now that we're above the 200 day moving average, now we're above the 3000 level on the S&P 500, then really we are very much in buy the dip mode. Now, does that mean that we're not going to see a second wave of coronavirus infections? Does that mean that we could well see further economic shocks? Absolutely, it does mean there is a risk of that. Will that derail this equity market rally? At the moment, you've got to ask yourself, um, what the what you know what what can stop an equity market sell-off? You've got the Fed buying corporate bonds. You've got the Fed implementing policy in a way that's never been done before. You've got the ECB. You've got fiscal stimulus. Really, with the amount of money that's being thrown at this, until such times as you get a significant break below significant support levels, you really have to look at what the price is doing. And the price at the moment, it's very much momentum is in favour of further gains. And while, and I'll say it again, I hate this rally because it flies in the face of all the fundamentals. Ultimately, you have to look at it in the context of what's being thrown at it. And until such times as the current uptrend that we're in gives an indication that it's about to come unstuck, you basically stay with the underlying trend. So those, those are the key levels on the S&P 500.
So just quickly, just quickly recapping um, the the UK the, the FTSE 100 um, support now comes in around about these previous highs, 6,200. So I think any dips in the FTSE should find decent support around about 6,200. So those are the key, those those are the three key indicators that I've been looking at this week in terms of equity markets. Have a quick look at the Nikkei 225, and again we've broken the 200-day moving average. So momentum is very much in equity markets' favour. It's very much in the case of look to buy dips until such times as the current uptrend shows signs of running out of steam, and at the moment it doesn't. So looking ahead. Um, you've really got to ask yourself whether any of the data that we're seeing come out really matters that much. Today we have non-farm payrolls. Obviously I'm giving the, I'm recording this before the payrolls numbers are released. They are likely to be bad, but it's also very likely the markets just do not care. Um, and really it's not about how bad the data is. It is, it's backward looking. It's really what is being thrown at the economies across the world to try and mitigate um, the economic damage that's likely to result the high levels of unemployment, um, and which are likely to get worse before they get better. But the hope is, and the expectation is, that this wall of money and this fiscal stimulus will prompt the, the unemployment rates that are currently rising to be much, much lower by the end of the year than they will be or than they, than they are set to be in the next couple of months. So in essence, markets are pricing in best case scenario, V-shaped recovery, rising unemployment now with an expectation that unemployment rates will be much lower by the end of the year as furloughed and laid off workers return to the workforce by the beginning, by the end of Q3 and the beginning of Q4. So next week, what are we looking at? We've seen a big sell-off in the dollar this week. Um, the euro's gone up significantly over the course of the past few days. We can see that here in the last three weeks. The euro's gone up along with pretty much equity markets. Very much risk on. We can see that here. Back towards the previous highs. You've got to think that the air is going to start to get a little bit thin anywhere near around about 114 uh, and uh, 115 in these, these previous highs um, from a year ago. June last year, um, but also March this year. Whenever we've been above 114, the euro hasn't been able to sustain that momentum for very, very long. Um, so um, when we look ahead to the week ahead, having come off what is another positive week for equity markets and a poor week for the dollar, we've got the latest Fed meeting on the 10th of June. We've got the latest China trade numbers for May over the weekend. They are due out Sunday night, I believe. Um, we've got potentially an OPEC plus meeting over the course of this weekend. Um, it's, which I penciled it in my week ahead for the 9th of June. Unfortunately, the date for that meeting is a little bit of a moving target. So it's throwing a dart at a dartboard and hoping that you hit the bullseye. Um, but again, that's driven a very decent rebound in oil prices this week, so I'm going to talk about that. We've got some UK data out this week on the 12th of June, and that is likely to be ugly. Um, industrial production, manufacturing production, and GDP. What one month GDP and rolling three months GDP. Um, we've also got German trade numbers, EU Q1 GDP. A um, couple of fairly um, Low-key earnings announcements, which I probably won't bore you too much with. I might mention them towards the end. British American Tobacco and Talk Talk Telecom all your numbers. Um, but let's start. Um, let's start with the China trade numbers. Now, obviously, there's continuing there's this continuing tension between the U.S. and China. But in terms of the current rebound. Um, or in equity markets and expectations of a V-shaped rebound, I think an awful lot of people are looking at China. They're looking at the fact that China was locked down in February. They're looking at the fact that this week we saw the Kaishin um, services PMI in China post its best number um, in May since 2010. 
and that has prompted optimism that we could well see a significant rebound in some of the May um, economic numbers. So we're going to start with China trade. Well, the most recent China trade numbers for April showed little evidence of a recovery in economic activity, despite the lifting of the lockdown that happened at the beginning of March. Exports did improve um, in April, they rose 3.5%, but I think this was largely as a result of the shipping of medical products like PPE to the rest of the world, as the rest of the world was in pretty much lockdown as a result of rising coronavirus cases. There were, there were more worrying signs about internal demand within China because that did remain weak. Imports fell sharply by 14.2%. So in terms of what we're expecting for China trade data for May, if those Kaishin services PMI numbers are going to be any sort of guide, you would expect to see a little bit of a recovery in exports and a little bit of a recovery in imports. Now expectations for China trade imports and exports for May aren't expected to be that positive. Exports are expected to decline 6.5% after a 3.5% um, positive number in April, and imports are expected to decline 7.9%. Now that will be an improvement on the 14.2% decline that we saw in April, but nonetheless it's still a negative number. So the, if that trade data isn't better than expected, then you have to really cast doubt on the fact that one month's services PMI is anyway indicative of a significant rebound in economic activity. I will be paying particular interest to the May retail sales numbers from China, which will be due out um, later in the month, I think around about two weeks from now. But certainly as a leading indicator, China's economic data will be closely monitored for any signs that we're going to similar, see a similar sort of rebound in economic activity as lockdowns are eased here in Europe. Looking at the Federal Reserve, which is the, the other key benchmark economic announcement for the coming week, not really sure that we can expect too many surprises from the Federal Reserve. There's been a great deal of speculation the prospect that the US could do, go down the negative rate route. I really don't think that's an option. And I don't really understand why markets are pricing the fact that the Fed could go negative. I think we've seen a host of commentary from a number of different Fed policymakers that are saying the Fed is not leaning in that direction. There are so many other tools that the Federal Reserve can use and are using. So, um, I think we have to take our cues from the comments, recent comments of Fed Chair Jay Powell. Now he suggested that the central bank was more minded to look at ways to control the yield curve by way of attempting to cap yields on certain time frames for twos, tens, and the 30 year in, in, in a manner that keeps a nice upward slope in the yield curve. Um, I think one of the main problems, and the ECB's found this out to its cost, is a flat yield curve or negative rates. Um, it's, you know, negative rates are absolutely toxic for your banking system. And I think unless central bankers learn the lessons of what's come before them, they'll all continue their own set of groupthink policies, um, which will continue to fail. I think it's encouraging that the Fed is not going down that route, um, because I certainly don't think it's the answer. There's no evidence that it works. And despite the fact the Bank of England is flirting with the idea, Personally, I think it's a bonkers idea. And if it if it worked, then I think the Europe Europe and Japan would be in a much better state than they currently are. The fact that it hasn't suggests that it's a failed policy. So I think one of the one of the key areas that the US Fed officials are worried about is the US banking system. And if they're worried about the US banking system, they're not going to go negative. So I really don't think it's something that the the Federal Reserve will consider. But it's certainly one area that will will continue to be probed by policymakers um, and uh, journos to see whether, and the markets as well, to see whether or not they're leaning in that direction. So what does that mean for the dollar? Well, we've seen a very bad week for the dollar um, over the course of the last few, um, few sessions. Um, we can see that in the CMC markets um, dollar index 
from here. Let me just change that font size so that you can all actually see um, the fonts that much clearer. Now, on our dollar index, we've broken quite a bit lower over the course of the last few sessions, which suggests that we could well um, be in line for further declines. But I, I, you know, I'm, I'm still of the opinion that um, despite the fact that we've broken lower, yes, we could potentially see a little bit more weakness. But overall, I would expect the dollar to sort of um, find a little bit of a base, just a little bit below the current levels that we're currently trading at, at the moment. And you also got to factor in that this dollar index here has a much greater weighting and a much lower weighting, much lower weighting for euro and a much higher weighting for the Chinese one, so or the Chinese renminbi. So as a result, it's certainly not as reactive to any moves in euro dollar as the ordinary dollar index is. So look, looking at looking at this, you can certainly see here that we've seen a significant move to the downside at some point we will probably find that we'll get a little bit of a rebound. And certainly if we look at a similar move here, um, we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight down candles before we got a strong rebound. We're pretty much at that level now where we are probably vulnerable to a rebound in the US dollar. We can certainly see that borne out in the way the cable is behaving and has been behaving over the course of the past few days. We are still there or thereabouts, 200 day moving average, still finding fairly solid support um, from this trend line here. But again, this, this, this is a huge level between 126.50 and 126.70.80, which is where the 200 day moving average is. That is proving to be a significant barrier. And we've got some very big economic data coming out this week. Again, it's backward looking. Again, it's probably not really instructive in terms of where the economy is now. Um, and um, the, the likely rebound as a result of the easing of lockdowns. And you've also got the added wrinkle that EU-UK Brexit talks aren't going particularly well. So that's likely to cap the upside for the cable in the short to medium term. But you can be absolutely certain that if we do break uh, above this level here and start to edge higher, I'm still of the opinion that at some point we will start to push back out towards these peaks at around about 132. It's likely to be a bumpy ride, don't get me wrong. We could head back all the way back to this trend line here, which is around about 123, 124. But certainly while the lows, the reaction lows are getting higher, then we will eventually take out these highs here, as long as we stay above this trend line here. Um, so, the data that we're looking at for this week is UK industrial production and manufacturing production for April. Well, the economy was locked down in April, so the data is going to be ugly. There's no getting away from that. It's going to be awful. Um, so the question is whether you really pay that much attention to it. We've already seen the measures that have been un implemented by Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rishi Sunak, and they are quite comprehensive in nature. What we do know, or what we are expecting, is that the UK economy in April on a monthly basis is expected to contract by 18%, 1.8% month on month. That equates to a rolling quarter-on-quarter -quarter decline of minus 10%. But with the £330 billion fiscal stimulus plan that's been rolled out, the hope is that in the second half of this year, some of that economic output should be recovered. Um, not all the jobs that have been lost will come back, but the downside impact will hopefully have been mitigated in the second half of this year as we slowly ease the lockdowns in Q2, in May and June. So industrial production is expected to decline 13.9%, manufacturing production minus 15.5%. That is all out on the 12th of June. So what does that mean for euro sterling? Well, you can see, again, we've got a nice little rebound here. We are starting to run out of steam in and around the 90 level. We, we had had a go at it at the end of May. We've come back down. We've retested it. We haven't been able to recover back above it. So at the moment, um, 90 looks a decent area 
and potentially go short with the stop loss above um, the previous high um, for a move back towards these lows. Here's again, we tend to be, we seem to be in a little bit of a range for euro sterling, certainly decent support at 88.70. So certainly I think any weakness is likely to be confined to that 88.70 area until such times as we break below it. But at the moment, it appears to be a range trade between 88.70 and just above that 0.9 area. Got the latest German trade, Germany trade numbers. As with China in, Mar in March, the picture of the trade in Germany is likely to be similarly true in that we're going to see big drops in both imports and exports. So not really expecting too much in the way of the German data. Let's have a quick look at Brent crude. Um, because we do have an OPEC meeting and we've finally broken above that very big resistance line that I talked about in last week's week ahead at the $32 and a, or $33 a barrel level. We've now broken above that. We can see that there when we did break above it. It then acted as support for the move back above $40 a barrel. And there is certainly scope for further gains in the oil price to try and refill this gap in and around here, um, which is currently between um, the lows of $45 a barrel and that peak there, which is around about $39. So there's a $6 gap in the cash contract for Brent crew, which needs to be filled at some point, which means that there's certainly potential for at least another $5 move higher in Brent crude to towards $45 a barrel before we start to drift back down again. Um, and that really, I think, will depend on the upcoming OPEC Plus meeting, um, where the hope is, amongst OPEC Plus members, that there will be an agreement to extend the production cuts that came out in May into the month of June. Now, there has been an agreement um, between the Saudi Arabia, between Saudi Arabia and the Russians to do just that. But there is a rising irritation amongst those two members about the lack of compliance from countries like Iraq and Nigeria who haven't lived up to their part of the bargain. Now, the upcoming meeting is likely to determine how much longer these agreed, these agreed cuts will last. There is consensus for another month, but they want them, but it's conditional on the non compliance like Iraq and Nigeria in signing up to them. So, there's, there's a number of moving parts. I think there's certainly potential for the cuts to be agreed for another month, but I think I think there's a little bit of a reluctance for them to extend much beyond the end of June. But that certainly doesn't suggest that we can't see further upside in the crude price. So that's um, Brent crude. Quickly have a look at gold. Um, finding support just above the 50-day moving average at the moment, there is evidence perhaps that it's starting to carve out, carve out a little bit of what could be a head and shoulders reversal here. You've got a left shoulder here, potential head here, with a right shoulder forming here. If we do break below this line, then certainly we could see a very sharp move back down to around about 1650, 1640. But we need to break below the 50 day moving average and we need to break the neckline of what could be the start of the construction of a potential head and shoulders reversal on the gold price. So keep an eye on that because that could be an interesting um, trading pattern going forward. Um, some earnings announcements we've got Talk Talk Telecom um, coming out on um, the 11th of, 11th of June, that's their four year numbers. Um, they, they're sort of the, uh, one of the one of the minnows in the UK um, telecoms space. Been punching well below their weight. That time they started to punch slightly above their weight. Seen a decent rebound over the course of the past uh, few weeks. Could well run into a little bit of resistance around about the 100p level. So I think any expectation um, that uh, the numbers their numbers might come in better than expected. It's probably largely priced in. We've also got um, US cinema chain AMC Entertainment Holdings, and they're in big trouble. Um, they took a two billion dollar impairment charge uh, in a pre-results announcement earlier this week, 
and they have said that there's a good chance that if, unless cinemas reopen very, very soon, they may not be able to continue trading. Certainly the share price doesn't reflect that if you look at a share price on a daily basis. But if you look at it on, say, for example, a weekly basis, it gives you a slightly better indication of how far they've fallen and how difficult um, the cinemas, cinema industry, which relies on footfall, is finding the current shutdown. So at the moment, they look to be on borrowed time and the cinemas are able to reopen fairly soon. We also have British American tobacco. And again, that's trading in a little bit of a range. There's a picture that found a little bit of a base suffering on the back of um, um, pushback they, against um, tobacco products. But also there's been problems with vaping and e-cigarettes and the health problems surrounding that. So they've been hit from both sides of the equation when it comes to their revenues. Tobacco revenues are suffering because of concerns about um, smoking, but there's also concerns about e-cigarettes and vaping and health problems in a much younger cohort, 18 to 35, where people who've been smoking um, e-cigarettes have reported lung and respiratory problems. So um, it's not particularly um, a positive figure for BAT, but they do appear to be heading back towards the recent highs of the recent ranges. So, um, so that's it, I think, for um, this week's look at the week ahead. Um, thank you very much for listening. Uh, by this time next week, we'll know what the um, US payrolls numbers are likely to have been and whether or not there's some evidence that maybe the US unemployment rate is starting to plateau and there's evidence that um, US furloughed workers are starting to go back to work. Otherwise, I'd like to thank you all for listening. Um, I wish you all a nice weekend. And um, I'll speak to you all same time, same place uh, next week. Thank you.